Thank you, everybody. I want to introduce you this morning to this topic of artificial life uh, by giving you examples. So I'm going to show you many movies about artificial life. They're all laboratory experiments that we do using chemistry. So I call this artificial life through chemistry. And I'll start us off with just a little definition of artificial life or A-life. Um, if A-life is a field of study, wherein researchers examine systems related to natural life, so biology, for example. Um, its processes, its evolution, through the use of different means. So you've heard about this already today. Computers, robotics, and also biochemistry. And so what I'll be talking about today is um, artificial life in the context of chemical experiments. Historically, we can start with this guy. Uh, in the 1800s, who was working on protozoa. So he was interested in how the amoeba moves. Okay, it has a very nice fluid motion. And so what he did was he made an artificial life model of the amoeba way back then. So he took some fresh olive oil and he took some potash. So this is just some chemistry, and the chemist will know potash as potassium hydroxide. Anyway, he mixed these chemicals together. And what he found out, he made a little system in the lab that was moving quite a lot like the amoeba, and this is what he studied for uh, part of his time. So we took his recipe and put it in the lab, and so this is what we did. We took, his, uh, we took a dish about that big, so you can see it with your eye, and we poured in some fresh olive oil, which you see here, and then we started adding things to it. So the first thing I'm going to add to this is a droplet of water. So this has no reactive chemistry, it just has a red uh, food coloring in it, and that won't give us any interesting dynamics. Here it comes. Second drop of water I add has chemistry in it, active chemistry, and it's blue colored. So you can see from this video here, there's quite a difference, right, between these two systems. The pure water system really doesn't do anything. It's the same thing that happens in your kitchen typically when you add oil and water together, they don't mix, nothing really interesting happens. However, if you add chemistry to the system, like in this blue droplet here, everything suddenly becomes lively, right? Almost alive. And you can see it's, it's moving around, it's spreading, um, it's breaking apart into smaller droplets. These smaller droplets have some sort of interaction with each other and things like this. And this is what Bushley was interested in, how you can turn a non-living system into something that is behaving like a real organism. So in my lab, we study things like this, these dynamic processes. If you take droplets that normally don't do anything, and we basically animate them through chemistry, and you can see various examples here of different kinds of droplets doing various interesting things that we like, that we like to study. So this is what I'll be talking about today. So here are two examples. Two movies. One is showing a real living system, natural system. One is showing an artificial system that we create in the lab. And just have a look at these. Let me reset this for you so you can see again. And think about these two videos here. OK. So let's have a little survey. For example, one here, who thinks that is a living system? <laughs> Me, a few other friends out there think so. What about example two? Is that a video of a living system? <laughs> right. Very good, thank you for your participation. In fact, this is the answer here. Right, this is the living system. It's a very interesting living system. This video actually was taken here in Tokyo. Uh, and this is an artificial life system that we've been playing with in the laboratory. So you see, the point is not to trick anybody. It's just to give you an example of what it's like working with these systems. Once you start to animate something, you start to see things that seem lifelike or even have some sort of behavior that we might want to ascribe to it. So that's the whole point here. Okay, here's another video. 
If you take a microscope on that Bushley oil, uh, olive oil system, this is the kind of things you see. Really quite dramatic, dynamic, fascinating kind of things. Okay. So what are we talking about here when, we, when we're speaking about studying life through artificial life? So we can come... We could just compile lists of what we think are essential characteristics of life. This is a partial list that I just assembled for us today. Life should have a body. It should have a metabolism to convert energy and resources. It should have some sort of inheritable information to pass on to its offspring. It should have the ability to evolve. It should be able to move to find resources. And of course, all living systems should have some sort of death in some form, right? And you could add other characteristics to this list. And these are the kinds of things that we would want to study in the laboratory using these sort of chemical systems of artificial life. So here's just two more videos to show you some interesting behaviors. On the right, we see this uh, living cell that is moving towards a source that is being applied into the system with this little uh, syringe pipette here. Right? So you put it on that side, the cell moves towards it. You put it on the other side, the cell starts moving towards it. So the cell, the natural cell that you see there, it has receptors, right? It can sense its immediate environment, and then it could move itself towards where those resources are located. And so this is the kind of movement that we've been studying with our systems, like in this video here. We basically have a droplet that is sitting around, not doing much. And then once we start adding some chemical signals to the environment, it can sense those signals, and then it could move itself into those gradients, right? So it's very, very similar to what a living system is doing, but it's an artificial system. It's just chemistry, okay? It doesn't have protein receptors. It doesn't have DNA. It just has a few chemicals and is able to do this kind of thing for us. So I want to explain a little bit what what is actually happening here. This is a, a classic model in, in artificial life using robotics. We have two designs of two little robots here. Each of those little robots have these two sensors on one end, and they have two little wheels in the back, right? These sensors in the front uh, are sensitive to light, and there's a light source in the middle of that diagram, okay? So in the little robot A over here, when, it, when that sensor that's closest to the light source becomes activated, it sends that signal to the wheel in the back that it's wired to, and that wheel starts to spin fast, and so it moves away from the light source. The same robot, so the same sensors and same wheels on the, on the uh, right here, um, little robot B, has a different wiring, right? Same sensors, same wheels, but the sensor here that's closest to the light source becomes activated, and that sends a signal to the other wheel on the opposite side. So that starts spinning faster, so the robot then goes towards the light. So that's basically how you would tie together sensors and motors in a simple sort of um, robot diagram. It's the same kind of thing that's happening with our droplets. They have little sensors that are sensing the environment and then are able to move in that environment. So if that's true, then we could do some fun things with our droplet system. So here, here's a, going to be a moving droplet that needs to solve a maze. It's up there, top corner. Bottom corner, we have this source of the chemistry. And we see now, can this droplet find the source of that, of that chemistry? Absolutely, yes. Absolutely, yes. Yes, not clapping for me, clapping for this little this droplet guy. Right. It's interesting because for us it, does, it seems like that's a maze, but according to the droplet, probably it doesn't really realize there's a maze there at all. It's just following this chemical gradient, so it's actually very simple what the droplet is doing. But that's just a demonstration, again, of a droplet now able to sense the environment and then find its way through based on chemical signals. Okay. So if, let's go back to this list. These droplets have a body. They have a metabolism. There's a chemical uh, reaction happening in a lot of these. Inheritable information evolution. Not really, right? Maybe not yet, okay? They're too simple. Um, Self-movement, absolutely. And what about death? Well, um, many of these chemical systems I'm talking about, you mix the chemistry in the droplet, so there's chemical potential inside the droplet, right? There's fuel inside the droplet. It's the same thing with your car. You add some fuel to your car, 
so the car moves, and it moves as long as you have fuel in it. So it's the same thing for these droplets. They'll continue to move as long as there are fuel in them, and then they stop. So basically, they die. Okay. So we then thought about the system a little differently and said, well, instead of putting the fuel on the inside of the droplet, like you would do in your car, we put the fuel dispersed in the environment. Okay? So the droplet needs to move into the environment to find fresh sources of fuel. And so that's what this video here is showing. Um, it's a microscopic image of some very small droplets that don't have any fuel in them, but then they need to move into the environment where the fuel is dispersed in there. So you see the behavior here. So I call these immortal droplets because they'll continue to do this activity as long as we supply them with more fuel in the environment. Okay, so in that sense, they will never die. And that's a good reason to think about these as really artificial systems, right? These are just chemical systems, even though they might behave lifelike. Yeah, they're still kind of just doing some chemistry for us. And you might observe watching this video here, it looks like that smaller droplet tends to follow the path of that larger droplet. So that's something interesting, and that seems to happen over and over again. When you start animating these kinds of systems, um, you can get some kind of collective behavior. So droplets sort of uh, reacting together and doing various things together. As shown in this video here, we have two active droplets, and we see what happens. So, we see a kind of dance, don't we? Blue one follows the red, the red follows the blue, that kind of thing. That's a very common output of these things. And that, what that's showing us is the droplets are not just sensing different chemicals that we might put into the environment, but they can sense each other, and their actions influence each other. So that's why we get this collective behavior. In addition to that, things could get very kind of strange, that these droplets could also change shape, and sometimes drastically change shape depending on the chemical system that we're looking at. So sometimes people might think that a, a round droplet is boring, um, and, uh, but we can really get very complex kinds of reactions and interactions just with simple droplets, and some of them make amazing kinds of shape transformations. As you can see here in these videos. Okay, so I just want to say a few words about, well, once we have created something new in the lab like these kinds of systems, I mean, what could we do with this kind of technology? Is there a kind of future application for this? And I just want to give you one as an example, controlled transport. So this is like supply chain stuff here. Imagine that you have some sort of item that you want to transport somewhere. Well, you take the item and you need to package it to protect it. Then you put it on a boat or something, and you take it from point A to point B, and then you leave it at that destination, where it's then unpacked, and hopefully the cargo is fine. It's not damaged at all. So we then want to use these kind of um, motile droplets, these moving droplets, as a transporter. And so in this video, what you're seeing is one of those droplets again. This time it has a little piece of copper wire inside, and we just start playing with it. First, we get the droplet, we get the droplet to move the copper wire across there. Then we start changing the chemistry around the droplet, which appears to agitate it quite a bit. Do you see? And then we take the, we want the droplet to move to the, up on the other side, and which moves over there. And then we add more chemicals to say, OK, stop uh, transporting that, that copper wire. Please leave it go. It drops the copper wire and then moves out of the way. Okay, so that kind of thing is what we're talking about here. right? Um, that's with a, a piece of copper wire. What about something more complicated, like a living cell? So we do live cell transport, basically using our droplets again. You see the red droplets, and what you might not be able to see very well, but you'll see in a moment, is that the corners up on the top there, there are two little capsules that we've placed into these droplets. And we want these droplets to move and transport this across the, across the dish. Here comes the chemical signal. Droplets start moving, and you can see the little points there that they're moving around. Hopefully you can see them dragging them around. We treat them to say, okay, let go of the cargo, and then move out of the way. Right. OK, so what's left in the center are these two little packages. Right? And in those packages, we then go and harvest them. And then we want to see, well, we put live cells in there. 
um, will the cells survive? And the, the reason for that is why we have to put them in these little capsules is because this chemical system is a very harsh environment. As soon as you put a living cell in there, it dies. So you have to protect it from, from, the, from the chemical system. And when you take those little things and then you put them on a plate which has a lot of uh, nutrients so the cells can grow under these conditions, these are the little points that you see here. Those little points on there are the little capsules. And you can see that they're just proliferating with cells growing out of them. So the cells survive transport, and they're very happy to be transported by the system. OK, so, so some conclusions here. I wanted to give you some examples of artificial life from our laboratory when we're talking about chemical droplets. There are very diff many different kinds I showed you here. I talked about a potential application for this type of technology. But the motivation for doing artificial life is not just about technological applications. We want to learn something about life. And so some of the things I showed you today, I talked about non-living artificial systems that can display lifelike behaviors. I talked about self-motion, so to look, uh, the search for resources. I talked about group dynamics, so droplets can kind of coordinate with each other, and also morph into different shapes, for example, are some things. But those are just some characteristics that we can just say that we're able to make in the laboratory. So what about a deeper meaning for this? And so one thing that we've been playing with for some time is what is the motivation for a chemical droplet to move from A to B? Right? What is the point of that system? And so one way to think about this is that mo motion in these systems emerges as a method for self-preservation. What the droplet is doing is by moving and finding resources, it's delaying its death, right? It's delaying the point of equilibrium. So by doing this, it's actually preserving itself. And now self-preservation is something we usually think we can attribute to living systems. But if I'm able to make in the laboratory a simple chemical system, an artificial system that is not living, capable of self-preservation, then this is a very good example of why we're studying artificial life. Thank you.